Brothers and sisters, welcome to Lansdowne's Sunday message for the 25th of October 2020. Now, I shared a little over a week ago at the men's meeting from the book of Malachi, particularly Malachi 3 and verse 6, the first part of which says, for I, the Lord, do not change. One of the brothers there encouraged me to bring the message, bring the passage rather, to the wider church. And so we're going to do that today. Last Sunday, we looked at Lamentations 3, reminded about the faithfulness of God. And so today, we're going to look at how God is unchanging and what a great encouragement that is to us. I'm going to give you the whole passage or as much as I can for the context. So let's hear the word of God from Malachi chapter 2, starting at verse 17. That's Malachi chapter 2, starting at verse 17. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Let's hear God's word. Malachi 2, 17, and going in to chapter 3. It says, verse 17, 2, 17, you have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. And the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you, that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed. 
for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said, it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge, or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you in the name of your Son, and we ask you to speak to us. This passage, it speaks of his first coming, the one who came to his people. And Lord, we thank you for his redeeming love for us, that we are now counted among your people. And in these times of great change, all around we thank you that we come to you and you do not change and father we thank you that your word is the truth everlasting thank you father for this unchanging truth and now let us hear your voice speak to us we pray in jesus name we ask it amen Amen. Lord bless you through his word. So, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. For I, the Lord, do not change. In this changing world, this is a glorious, liberating truth. We have a foundation on which to rest amid everything that has happened and what may yet happen. Yes, it's easy to become discouraged and to feel hopeless. The battles that we faced before COVID haven't gone away and many of them have intensified because of the virus and the laws that have changed in order uh, to try and reduce the impact of the virus upon our society. Even though everything for us has changed, many, many things have changed. This text says, I, the Lord, do not change. And this has to be the rock on which we stand. Not only that, we have an assurance in this passage and this verse about his commitment to us. It says, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. So we're assured about him, but we're also assured about the ultimate outcome that we will not be consumed. Now, this amazing statement comes to us with a context. Verse Chapter 3, verse 6 is not an isolated statement, even though there's so much you could say about that single verse. But actually, the glory of it is enhanced by looking at the context because this is not given, this statement is not given to a people who are doing well spiritually or materially or in terms of their wider circumstances. 
They're living in a promised land back from exile, but they're surrounded by trouble and enemies and they're making a huge mess of their relationship with God. And it's into this mess that the word comes, I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. So it'll be helpful initially to look at the problem, the problem that Malachi is bringing God's word into. Now, the book of Malachi was written to a backsliding people. And the whole book is constructed as a series of challenges by God, almost like a conversation. So God is, says something and then he speaks as if they're talking back to him. And as they're talking back to him, they are denying or questioning the very thing that God is challenging them about. And the heart of their problem, as highlighted by the first verse of our reading, chapter 2 and verse 17, seems to be their view of God himself and his ways. So verse 17 says, You have wearied the Lord with your words. They are complaining so much that God is using a, an illustration to say as if you are wearing me out. Now, God cannot be worn out. He's reaching down to them in their condition and saying, you are going on and on with your complaining. And while I'm a God of patience, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, you need to be aware of your constant complaining against me. They don't seem to see who he is. They say, everyone, again, chapter 217, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. They even say, where is the God of justice? Because not doing anything in the situation we find ourselves. And then if you go down to chapter 3 and verse 13, God says to them, your words have been hard or severe or critical against me, says the Lord. And they say, how have we spoken against you? Uh, verse 14, you have said it is vain to serve God. They're feeling that God has let them down. They're feeling obedience is pointless. They're serving or kind of in an external way. They say, what profit is it to keep his charge? Or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts. So we're, as it were, on the surface, as if we're sorry for our sin, as if we're grieving, we're walking around mourning. But it gives us no gain at all. They were envying the sinners around verse 15 now we call the arrogant blessed they say they're blessed and look at us and you can see the effect of this slipping into unbelief stopping trusting god evildoers are prospering where is a god of justice he's not doing anything so we're going to call those who are sinning, those who are proud in their sin, we're going to call them blessed because it's pointless serving God. That is the condition that they're in. And the effect of the wrong view of God impacts their worship and their behaviour. There's not time to go through this whole passage or indeed the whole book. But if you were to pick up the book of Malachi and read it, you would see the children of Israel in deep spiritual trouble. They weren't worshipping right. They weren't trusting the Lord. They weren't giving their tithes. 
their marriages were breaking down. They were blaming God rather than themselves. They were assuming that God should make their life good for them, even while they were rejecting his commandments. They were put complaining about the success of the wicked, as we've seen, and that the Lord failed to act, but they didn't recognise their own sin. So, for example, in chapter 3 and verse 5, there's a whole list of sins there. Sorcery, adultery, lying, lying oaths, oppression of the worker, failing to meet the need of the widow and the fatherless, and of the alien, the immigrant, into the nation. Their situation was a mess. But look what God says into this situation. He says, I, the Lord, do not change. However, unbelieving or disobedient, the professing church becomes that is those who say they believe in the lord however unbelieving or disobedient they become however messed up the world becomes however doubting and fearful his true people become nothing changes the lord he's not changed by the world and he's not changed by us. And chapter 3 and verse 6 comes as a as two things. The Lord does not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. He's saying to them through Malachi, even though you deserve to be, all the things I've said in the whole of this book about your behaviour, even though you deserve to be consumed, you are not because of his covenant love and his promises. So into the problem highlighted by, by chapter 217, where is the God of justice? Everyone who does evil is, is good in the sight of the Lord. And those verses in chapter 3, verse 14, is vain, empty, pointless to serve God. Into that, the unchanging God brings his answers. And we find that answer in chapter 3, and particularly the first four verses. These verses refer to the coming of Christ. Chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, that's it. Look, take notice. In answer to your accusation, where is the God of justice? What is he doing? He says, my messenger is coming. I will send him. That is John the Baptist. Then it says, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, the Messiah you're longing for. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord. And he did come, just as he promised. And this answer, where is the God of justice? What are you doing? Well, actually, he's saying you're going to see it and this will prove to you. For... I, the Lord, do not change. From the very beginning, I promised that I will come. I promised to Adam in the Garden of Eden. I promised to Abraham. I promised to Moses. I promised to David. I promised through the prophets. And now through this final prophecy, before he comes, I'm making my promise to you again. And the warning is, who will, uh, verse uh, 2, who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? They're looking for someone to come and deal with the enemies around. But he is saying to them, actually, I need to deal with you. And the illustration of him coming and cleansing like a, 
uh, uh, someone who is purifying metal or someone who is doing washing. That is the, the, the fuller soap, the soap used to draw the dirt out of, of garments to make them clean. So this picture of one coming who would deal with and separate from them the sins of his people. Now we know as we move into the New Testament how he did that. He didn't come to march against the Romans. He came to die on the cross to deal with the sins of his people, to remove their sins as far as the east is from the west, to suffer the judgment for the things lifted in verse 5. He came to save his people. He came, uh, verse 1, suddenly, unexpectedly, not in the way they thought he would come. He came to defeat sin. And we know this is true because here we are after the first coming of Christ. We are waiting again now for the second coming of Christ. But we have the assurance that God keeps his promises. Even though we fail, we have the assurance he keeps his promises because he kept all of those promises in the Old Testament. And just as he said, this Messiah, the Lord Jesus, would come. And so, yes, we wait for his second coming. He too will come suddenly, at a time we do not expect. He will come to his temple. He will come to his people to rescue his people. He will come not to consume us, even though we deserve that, but to make us free from sin forever, face to face with him. He will come, according to chapter 3 and verse 18, once more you'll see that the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, he will come to separate. And he then is a challenge, because in this passage, you, you, you see there are those complaining. And as we'll see in a little while, there are those, chapter 3, 16, who fear the Lord. The challenge is, and often our, where our faith rests is exposed by trouble. And this trouble of COVID-19 and all the rules and regulations and changes to our lifestyle, they expose where our faith rests lies but are we those who fear the lord or are we those who just assume that god exists just to make our life easy only those who've received the coming one the messiah the lord jesus christ are those that he counts righteous not because they deserve it but because they've received his righteousness as a free gift They've had their sins cleansed away. I need to ask you, whoever you are, I don't know who watches these videos, I need to ask you, have you been cleansed from your sin? Have you received the Lord Jesus? Are you ready for him to come again? As he will come when the time is right. And so we have the problem, the problem of their sin and rebellion and their wrong view of God. We have the answer which is a coming of christ and all that points us to the foundation so let's go back now to chapter 3 and verse 6 he is the lord and he does not change in the context of all their failure he says i the lord do not change and in one sense he's he's he, he's using a contrast deliberately because he calls them the children of jacob not 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 just his people but the children of jacob and of course jacob's name was changed to israel but jacob means one who is a supplanter and the the 
by calling them the children of Jacob, he's reminding them, actually, you haven't changed. You're still like your ancestor Jacob, pushing for your own way, doing your own thing, trying to get gain and success in your own strength. It was only later that Jacob came to truly trust in the Lord. He's saying, you fail continually. You're still like you always were, but I do not fail and I do not change. I do not change. I'm not changed by your behaviour. I'm not changed by your opinion of me. I'm not changed by your complaints about me. And all the things that the scriptures tell us about him are still true today. He is still everlasting. He is still almighty. He is still good. He is still faithful. He is still holy. He is full, still full of steadfast love and compassion. The Westminster Shorter Catechism and question four asks this, what is God? And the answer is, God is a spirit, infinite, eternal and unchangeable. Unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness and truth. He is unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness and truth. The unchanging God. He does not change. His promises do not change because he does not change. In fact, he cannot change. Yes, he is a God of the impossible, but actually he cannot change. He cannot sin, James 1.13 tells us. He cannot lie, Hebrews 6 and verse 18 tells us. He is always, he cannot change. Exodus 3, Exodus 3 and verse 14, I am that I am, the unchanging God. In fact, if you think about it for a moment, it's impossible for God to change because if he changes for, he either changes for the worse or for the better. But he cannot change for the worse because Psalm 136 verse 1, which we read at the beginning of last Sunday's service, it says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. So he cannot change for the worse. Now, can he change for the better? No, because Matthew 5 and verse 48 says, your heavenly father is perfect. So he cannot change. We've not got this question where maybe he doesn't want to change. I don't want to get balder, but I will get balder. I don't want to get wrinkles, but I will get wrinkles. It's not that God doesn't want to change, but might be forced be by the devil or some great pressure or some unexpected thing to change. No, he cannot change. And indeed, the devil is not king of the universe. The Lord is. So he is as good and powerful and holy and loving and gracious and merciful and faithful and true as he always has been and he always will be and to help us in this turmoil of covid and everything going on with it as well as the troubles we face in our own lives our focus needs to be upon him you say well, what do i do with this uh, statement, I, the Lord, do not change. Well, actually, we pay attention to him. We think about him. Uh, Spurgeon's first recorded sermon, the first one in the first book of his sermons, is actually on this text of Malachi 3 and verse 6. And he, he reminds uh, his readers or his listeners in the first instance 
that actually it is the, 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 the thing the Christian should study more than anything else is God himself. That's where we grow in all the changing scenes of life and all the trouble that we face. We need to turn our attention to him. And as we focus on him, we're assured of who he is and our faith is built up. We're assured of his covenant love. We're reminded even though we make a mess of things and sin, even though we go through some of the struggles that we read of here, we doubt, we question, we wonder what God is doing. Even though all of these things happen because he is 100% committed to us in unchanging covenant love, we are not consumed. We are forgiven. He pours his love into us and covers us with his mercy and grace. That's not saying it's good to sin. It's not. But when we do sin, the Lord does not consume us in his wrath. But he turns to us in his mercy. We don't need to hide from him. We don't need to pretend we haven't sinned. We can turn to him and confess our sins. And he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness amazing grace we don't need to worry and be burdened about the future we don't need to pretend that we haven't got fears and questions just like the psalmist has and we can bring these things to him knowing that he does not change that he is still the same god he is still all-powerful and he is still committed to us in covenant love and that brings us on to the final few verses and time doesn't permit to go through these in great detail, although there's so much encouragement in them. In the midst of all the trouble of the book of Malachi, in chapter 3 and verses 16 to 18, we see there are a people who trust him. It says, then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. Now these are not the grumblings of chapter 2 and verse 17, where is the God of justice? Or of chapter 3 and verse 14, it's vain, empty, pointless to serve God. These are people living, yes, in the midst of great trouble, great fear, concern about the future, concern about the enemies all around. But the Lord is, it says, chapter 3, verse 16, the Lord paid attention and heard them. Then it says, a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. A book of remembrance is an illustration. A king would have records and archives of the deeds of his people written before him so if you remember the book of Esther when Mordecai warned the king of danger that was written in the book and then when it came for Mordecai to be in danger the king got his book out and read the book and remembered what Mordecai had done. That's the illustration here. The Lord hears. The Lord sees. He pays attention. The Lord remembers. The Lord sees our cry and our trouble. The Lord hears us as we talk to each other and seek to encourage each other and we share our burdens with each other. And yes, we admit the, 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 the concerns we have about the present and the future we share our grief with one another we share our our burdens our fears with one another and he hears and he watches we share encouragements and he hears and he remembers and he says to them they shall be mine that's chapter 3 17 when i make up my treasured possession that's a reference to 
Exodus 19 verse 5, where God tells them, you are my treasured possession among all the peoples of the earth. Yes, we live in a world of turmoil, but if you are a Christian, the unchanging God's eye is upon you and he is working all things out for that final great day when Christ returns. So, O children of Jacob, yes, you're children of God, I'm a child of God, but we still waver and we're tossed around by all kinds of things, just like Jacob was. Because the Lord does not change, we are not consumed. We're treasured. We are not consumed by life or death. Because the unchanging God doesn't change in his being, his wisdom, his holiness, his power and his truth. Even though Israel was then surrounded by enemies and we face all kinds of trouble and God's people around the world face suffering and persecution, the enemies around are not more powerful. You are not consumed by death or ultimately by trouble because the Lord's power is still the same. He's the same Lord who took Israel out of Egypt, provided food in the wilderness and gave them the promised land. He's the same God who raised Christ from the dead. He's the same God who poured out his spirit in the book of Acts and the church, the gospel spread all around the known world. He's the same God who saved you that day when you believed and you moved from life to death. He's the same God. Therefore, you, whoever you are, if you are his child, you are not consumed. You know, even if all the armies of hell attacked us he is still the same God who made the heavens and the earth he's a still the same God who defeated the devil's power through the cross and resurrection he's still the same who in Christ cast out demons and raised the dead nothing has changed there are times when we feel the enemy's attacks on every side when worry fills our hearts and minds when we're so sick when we don't know how we're going to pay the bills, when people insult us, when fears grip us. But you, O oh child of God, are not consumed. None of these things, even though they are powerful, and yes, they're painful, are able to consume us because the Lord does not change not even death he defeated death so death takes us to be with him whatever you are facing today you O oh child of god will not be consumed you will be refined because not only has he forgiven us, but he's also cleansing us. And yes, we do go through the refiner's fire. This is not consumption of us. It is God's loving care. And in the struggles we face through that refiner's fire, he, we speak with one another, we speak to him. And the Lord pays attention and he hears and he remembers. I, the Lord, do not change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. He keeps you through his unchanging grace. As the hymn writer says, grace has brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. So think on him, turn to him in obedience, trust him, talk to him, 
and talk about him so that we encourage one another in these times. Grace will take you home. Let's pray. Father, thank you for you being the unchanging God. Thank you that although we still fall and sin, we still behave like children of Jacob rather than children of God. Lord God Almighty, thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for Christ's coming. Thank you for his cleansing. Thank you for him being that one right sacrifice that's made us right with you. In all our wandering, and sin, and fear, and doubt, and questioning, Lord, help us to turn our gaze upon you, the unchanging God. Help us to talk to you, to talk to one another and encourage each other, and to trust you the unchanging God. We thank you that we are not consumed because you do not change. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord encourage you, refresh you, the Lord shine his face upon you. The Lord give you his peace in these days. Amen.